All right, guys, welcome back to the show. My name is Calvin Smith, and I'm your host of Unquestionable. And today I have a really interesting guest that I'm really excited to share with him today um, because I actually just did a episode with Atlantis going over different theories such as like Randall Carlson and Jimmy from Bright Insight. I even touched on um, my guest theories for tonight. And uh, my guest today is Dr. Greg Little, and he's a psychologist and explorer of the ancient world and its mysteries. And since 2003, Greg and his wife, Laura, have been actively searching the Bahamas for archaeological ruins that might be linked to Atlantis. So that's really interesting. And along with archaeologist Bill Donato, the Littles have conducted multiple explorations of the Bimini's, the Andros, and the Great Bahama Bank. And uh, their explorations have been featured on the National Geographic Channel, the Learning Channel, MSNBC, Sci-Fi Discovery, History Channel. Guys, they've been everywhere. And Greg is also the co-author of the books Edgar Casey's Atlantis, Mound Builders, uh, Ancient South America, and uh, People of the Web, and has been, I'm sorry, and has over 30 books in the in print of various fields of psychology. So welcome to the show, Dr. Little. I really appreciate you coming in today. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Uh, nice intro. Uh, sounds like it came from something, but anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, and we'll see where we can go here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did steal a couple couple bits of that because um, like I, I kind of talked to you in um, uh, through email and on Twitter where I found you. Um, I've, I've been following your work for only a couple of weeks. It was only recently when I kind of started looking into Atlantis and everything that your name started popping up. And I was like, who is this Dr. Greg Little guy? So I started looking you up and you have some very compelling evidence regarding a possible lost civilization. Um, off the coast of the Bahamas. And and can you tell me a little bit more about what you and your wife, Laura, have been doing and why exactly this sparked your interest? Wow. Okay. So sparking the interest, uh, that probably goes to, it begins when I got interested in archaeology, which was actually around, around 1983 or so, or 82. I had just finished my first book in 1983. And Back in those days, you'd send a manuscript off and you'd wait and you'd wait and you'd wait. Uh, then you'd hear from them and you'd send it off again when you got a rejection and all. And so it took about a year, year and a half for the process to take place. Uh, in that interim, I got interested in archaeology through a through dreams, actually. And uh, I've written about that in several books. I've told the story in it. But anyway, uh, somewhere even before that, I had been interested in Edgar Casey mainly uh, Edgar Casey's readings on health. Now, Edgar Casey was America's most famous psychic. Uh, he was born in 1877, died in 1945. Uh, but he had done thousands, tens of thousands of psychic readings, most of which were about health. People had health issues. They would ask Casey for advice. He would give some sort of advice, some sort of remedy. People would try the remedy. The uh, a number of physicians researched Casey back then when he was doing the readings. He got very famous because of what the, the physicians found, and that is that his, his health remedies virtually always worked. When they could follow him up, they always worked. Uh, in modern times, uh, many people have studied Casey, including physicians, medical researchers. Uh, they've published articles in medical journals, and those medical journals generally say that Casey was correct. Uh, somewhere between 84 to 88 percent of the time. That's what the studies show. That doesn't mean he was wrong the other times. Right. They just couldn't tell. They couldn't follow up and see what happened with the yeah. people who he'd made the recommendations to. So Edgar Casey's psychic readings, I said uh, most of them were about health, and it's actually 60, right at 67 percent were about health. The others were about a variety of things, everything from ancient philosophy to ancient history to various mysteries like Amelia Earhart's disappearance. Her husband, okay. George Putnam, contacted Edgar Casey and asked about Amelia immediately after she disappeared. There's other kinds of readings like where he actually, this is strange, you probably never heard this, Edgar Casey went to the White House secretly uh, when Woodrow Wilson was president. Wilson was sick and they brought Casey in to do readings with Woodrow Wilson wow. into the White House. That's wow. pretty much unknown. 
Uh, there are a lot of other examples of Casey with very famous people, loads of very famous, well-known people. Uh, the inventor of FM radio credited Edgar Casey for giving him the specs in how to build FM radio. That's just another example, but there's loads of them. Yeah. Part of Casey's readings included a story of a lost civilization called Atlantis. I had no interest whatsoever in that. I mean, none, no interest. Uh, I was interested in archaeology at the time, and around the year 1998, one of the directors of the Casey Organization, which is known as the ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia Beach, one of the directors asked me to do a, uh, an analysis of Edgar Casey's readings on mound builders, which I had gotten very interested in mound builders because of dreams. And I was working on a encyclopedia of mounds, which subsequently was finished and came out, uh, and a variety of other books that had mounds in them. So I looked at Casey's mound readings, which I don't even know existed. There were roughly 58 readings where Edgar Casey talked about Native American Indian mounds. That's how it started. In the course of evaluating the readings on Indian mounds, that is when I first found that Casey talked a lot about Atlantis. He tied it into uh, North and South American archaeology. I knew Casey had said that Bimini, a small Bahamian island about 50 miles due east of Flor Fort Lauderdale, Miami, that Bimini was once a part of, the, of one of the islands of Atlantis. That's the best way to put it. I knew that. I knew about the research that had been done by people before us and I had no, no interest whatsoever in going and looking. I believed everything the skeptics said. That is, they said that everything that had been found in the Bahamas was um, recent it, or it was natural. There were no archeological ruins there. In fact, mainstream archeology span says the Bahamas weren't occupied until about the year 1000, okay. which is crazy. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I did the analysis on that. And in the course of that, during that time period, my wife and I were both uh, doing a newsletter for the ARE called Ancient Mysteries, which went to the members. And part of what I did was help determine who would come in and talk at the ARE's Ancient Ancient Mysteries Conference. And I discovered this guy in England called Andrew Collins. This was about yes. 1999 to 2000. Andrew has since become a real good friend, but I arranged for Andrew to come over and give a talk. Andrew had written a book about Atlantis and he talked a lot about what Edgar Casey said. And Andrew said that Atlantis, the main island of Atlantis was Cuba, which is oh. a very, very interesting idea, okay. which we have followed up on. So when Andrew came to the ARE, this was 2002, gave his first talk there. I remember sitting there and, and watching the presentation and some of the pictures that he had put up. And one of the pictures that Andrew had put up was a picture of what looks like a triple ring of stones in the Bahamas uh, in shallow water supposedly discovered. And it was discovered in 1968 by pilots. They got a photo of it. Uh, it was somewhere in the Bahamas near Andros Island, which is the largest of the Bahamas islands. And no one had ever been able to find it. So think about that, a triple ring of standing stones. So imagine something that is much larger than Stonehenge. And instead of having one ring of stones, there are three. That is right. what they said was there. And they said it was somewhere between 500 to 1,000 feet in diameter, which wow. makes it enormous. And I couldn't believe no one's ever found it. Well, he yeah. talked about, Andrew also showed one other photograph, can't come from the same time period, 1960, 1968, near Andros Island of what looked like the letter E. Now I'm saying E, the cursive letter E, very small E. Okay. But you look down from the sky into the water and you see E. Now, oh, when really? we did our when we did all of our studies in the Bahamas, which we did loads of aerial surveys, flew, flying thousands of miles on 
very close to the water, about at roughly at about 500 feet all the time. Yeah. Uh, we saw almost every letter in the alphabet somewhere. Really? Yes. Uh, when you really search, you'll see almost every letter of the alpha. I mean, every letter is there somewhere. You just fly around and look. So I decided at that talk, I remember turning to my wife during Andrew's talk saying, I can't believe no one has ever found that. If it exists, it is probably one of the most incredible archaeological finds of all time. Definitely. And that is this triple ring of standing stones. So we decided we're going to go find it. That's how this all started. So in January of, of 2003, we began our explorations. And what we did over the next, roughly the next 10 years, we made 25 one week to 10 day trips into the Bahamas, doing all kinds of unwater, underwater searches using three different side scan sonars, lots of underwater cameras, lots of aerial explorations we'd fly uh, like how we found this so-called triple ring of stones and the e was we wound up taking a uh, small well they're two engine very small charter planes and flying very low when we'd find the formations we would uh, get the gps from the air that was the missing element you really can't find these things from the water just looking around right i mean it's hit or miss but from the air, you can see them. The difference is we could get the GPS, whereas years ago, GPS didn't exist. So that's how we found them. We were told where it was by the actual pilot who took the picture. Uh, oh. We found him in Miami, Florida. No really? one had ever asked him where this thing was. Really, People oh. had spent years looking for it. Lots of money was spent looking for it. Uh, and I remember pretty vivid because we, we videotaped him uh, in the interview. It's in several documentaries. And his exact word was when, when I asked him, has anybody ever asked you? He said, curiously, people have been very uncurious about it. A very strange sentence. But he said nobody cared. Nobody ever asked him where it was. But yeah. he pulled out a pilot's map. An aerial pilot's map laid it out. There was Andros, and he said, it's right about here, pointed right exactly to it. Right. The problem was it's in Cuban airspace. Yeah. Part of the Bahamas is in Cuban airspace. airspace. Southern Andros Island is in Cuban airspace. Gotcha. Uh, I found the charter pilot. I also had a pilot's license. Uh, I'm not active anymore, but I had a pilot's license at the time. Uh, so I flew as co-pilot. We flew down there in this two-engine Norman Islander, which is a very slow but very safe plane, found all this stuff in Cuban airspace. Pilot was happy to do it. He wanted to be able to brag yeah, that he'd gone into I Cuban bet. airspace. Yeah. Uh, and the Cubans actually shot down planes up until the, seven, uh, the late 70s. I don't know if you know that. They would shoot down private planes. Wow. So Yeah. 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 So you can look all wow. that up. It's really interesting. That's crazy. So, so it's... Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so is is this? Uh, so you said that before GPS, it wasn't visible. Um, I guess you could see it, but nobody nobody knew where to look exactly. Right. And Andros Island is 104 miles long, 35 miles or so wide, and it has inlets all over. Everybody thought is was in an estuary, which is a uh, Andros is cut by what are called tidal bites. B-I-T-E-S. Okay. And the bites look like rivers cutting through the island, but they're not rivers. It's just the tide moves water back and forth. So okay. sometimes they're dry. Sometimes they are filled with water. It depends on the tides. So everybody was looking in the island and they were looking on the wrong side of the island. No oh. one had ever seen it there. So we went to the, we flew right to it, found it right away. We found the E right away too, got the GPS on those. Uh, they were they were separated in distance by about 108 miles. The E and the triple ring of stones, which is not stones. I, I got to quit saying that now. Uh, <laughs> we landed on Eastern Andros. Andros is almost totally uninhabited. It is totally uninhabited on the western side. Cell phones don't work anywhere on the, out there. Hmm. Satellite phones don't work. Satellite phones are blocked by the military there. And um, you see no boats. 
you see no planes, there is nothing. You are really on your own. It's very yeah. dangerous. A lot of people told us this. That's too dangerous. Don't do it. Yeah. Uh, we were yeah. cautioned repeated, repeatedly about it. But anyway, we got a sponge diver to take us in a small, looks almost like a rowboat, had a small engine in it. It took an entire day to get through the island to the other side. He had to stop the boat repeatedly. And it's good that he did this because I learned a lot of stuff about boats and boat motors from him. The, so much sand would be sucked up into the uh, outboard motor that it would stop. So he had, had to, he had to un uh, unclog it. Uh, and you literally pull off the, the little tubes on the thing yeah. where the water goes through oh, and you man. have to suck it out and you <laughs> blow it out and all that. But that saved us too, because not too long after that, we realized we need our own boat that goes very fast, that has a shallow draft that is very safe and has backups. Yeah. Uh, and I had to do that with our boat several times too, even though we had giant, had 250 horsepower engines on it. Uh, and 10 horsepower backups, but they always clogged with sand in the shallows. Yeah. So anyway, we got to this thing. It was very exciting for the sponge diver. And he's the first one who saw it. We went to the GPS and then we saw it. Uh, it's five miles off of shore uh, and you could stand in it. The water there is so shallow, you can walk five miles into the ocean. Now you can do that at low tide, uh, or high tide, that's up to you. Uh, but it's very shallow. And at low tide, what happens is the water is lower and there is a ring of sponge, sponge, giant black sponge, hmm. never been picked. That's a huge sponging area. That's how the Bahamian sponge divers made a lot of money back in the 1800s yeah. selling natural sponge. But some of them were like five feet tall. Wow. And when the when it's low tide, they stick out of the water and they look exactly like standing stones. So okay. that was our first discovery, which we really debunked a mystery that started in the 1960s. It was disappointing. But I never thought it was going to be a triple ring of standing stones anyway, because if it had been, I know that some archaeologists would have wanted to find this thing so they could be wow. famous. Yeah. So uh -huh. later it was uh, one month later, we went back because the E, the little E shaped formation was right. on the north end of the island. So we had to make other arrangements to find another way to get to it. We got to it then. And it was what is called a small coral head, a circular coral head. And it just had turtle grass growing it in this weird E shape where there were cracks. Very strange, but completely mm. natural. And then we found there are lots of these that are completely natural. That was going to be the end. I didn't want to go back. I had no intention of doing the stuff on anything on Atlantis. I had no intention of doing any research on it or, you know, I was happy. I really don't like boating and scuba right. diving. I don't like it. I actually got certified as a scuba diver uh, right before we went to the Bahamas the first time, just in case we wound up in some deep water. So anyway, so we found the E, we were going to fly out in the charter the very next morning. We were staying in this really bad motel in north eastern Andros, the only real town there. It's all the way at the top of the island on the east coast. Uh, it's not a tourist town. There are very few tourists there. Uh, there's only 5,000 people that live on that whole island anyway. So it was pouring rain. There was a knock at the door and a guy came to the door. Uh, obviously an American who had lived on Andros. And he asked us about the treasure we were looking for. What treasure? Because everybody's treasure hunting. Everybody wants Spanish galleons. That's what they're after. And we told him, we're not looking for treasure. If we find it, we're going to turn it in anyway, because it's not ours. I know yeah. the law. I work in criminal justice. That's what I've done in criminal yeah. psychology since the 1970s. I have no intention of doing anything illegal, particular anything. Yeah. So, I we told him that we showed him the books. We had these uh, copies of, of pictures that we had of these various sites we were looking for. 
And here's what we're looking for, we said. And he said, okay. He said, well, I believe you. He said, everybody's looking for treasure. So he told us about this formation that was less than a mile from where the, the, this little motel was where we were staying on a beach, which I call it a beach, but it's just an inlet. And he said he'd found it some years ago. He was a scuba operator on Andros. He couldn't do it anymore. He was retired. Mm -hmm. And he said, I saw this formation. It looks a lot like the Bimini Road, but it's bigger. And it's got three rows. And, he, and I said, what? Because I'd never heard of this. He said, yeah, nobody knows about it. He said, it's never been publicized. He said, I don't know of anybody that's ever seen it other than me and a couple people I've had there. So I asked him how you get to it. And he said, go to the spot, just go straight out. Next morning at dawn, my wife and I walked up to this beach carrying my, uh, actually it was snorkel gear and cameras and all that. And I snorkeled out a couple hundred yards into very deep water. Couldn't find it. I said, this is crazy. So we went to another spot and walked out on this really rocky karst, K-A-R-S-T, it's type of rock, okay. this rocky point. And karst is sharp. It can cut your feet. So you got to be careful yeah. on it. And then I went out at a strange angle. And suddenly on the bottom, I saw these giant blocks of stone that all looked like they'd been cut. Wow. They The blocks were mainly rectangular. They were about a foot and a half thick, which is very thick. Mm -hmm. And then they were all fitted together into three long rows. The first row had blocks roughly 10 by 20 feet, which is huge. Yeah. Definitely. Perfectly straight edges. And then there'd be another one and another one. It ran for about a thousand feet. And it was in fairly deep water. Then toward the deep water, it rose where the second one was, a second row that went over a thousand feet. It was curved. And then there was a third one. And they were all made of the same blocks. And the blocks on the third one had tiers. They were, they were stacked up. And it looked exactly like a harbor. And you'd call it a key. And, and I'm saying the word key because there's a bunch of different spelled words uh, that mean key, but this is Q-U-A-Y. Q-U-A-Y is right. pronounced key. Uh, <laughs> and it is a breakwater. It looks like a Mediterranean breakwater. So I got a couple pictures of it before we left the next day. Couldn't believe it. Sent them out to some geologists uh, at universities and to people who had done the initial research at Bimini. And I asked them, what does this look like? What do you think this could be? The geologists were really excited about it. They said, if this is a natural, if this is a formation of natural beach rock, which we'll get to what that means shortly, mm -hmm. they said, it's really important. It's one of the most unique ones they'd ever seen. They wanted a location and all that. Uh, we decided we needed to get back. We immediately got a trip back and then we started filming it and photographing and measuring. We made our own documentary about it. Then all of a sudden, uh, the learning channel and discovery uh, and then National Geographic, all of them got interested in it. Um, there were some of these documentaries that were really bad in that people don't know this. They act like you're discovering things. Uh, right. They wanted us to reenact it, but reenact it on yeah. Bimini. Because they didn't want to, they didn't want to spend the money to fly their people to Andros, which is wow. harder to get to, uh, and it, the logistics at Andros are very difficult. So yeah. they just didn't want to go. But anyway, a lot of the others did. We did a series of documentaries on it. The last one we did was U the show UFO Hunters. The next to the last show of UFO Hunters was called the Underwater Area Fifty One, uh, and on it. And I hate the. we quit doing documentaries because they take what you say yeah. and they splice in different it, things. Yeah. They edit it. For example, on that show, we were at this formation at Andros and they ask us, we were standing on the beach and they ask us, what is it you're looking for here? What is it we're looking at? And then you see me say the word Atlantis, which is not what I said. <laughs> Um, somewhere in the course of all of our talking, I said the word Atlantis. So they moved it yeah, and they, and they stuck it. it in there. But wow. what I said is what we believe we've found here is a, 
uh, a formation of stone that forms a breakwater for a harbor. And we have dated it. We dated it by carbon dating. You can carbon date beach rock. You can't carbon date rock, but you can carbon date beach rock because beach rock is a type of rock formed from carbonate stuff in the water mixed in with shell and everything uh, else. It, is, it forms on the beach. It's yeah. natural limestone, right. but it has lots of, of organic carbonate material in it. So you know when the stone forms. You can actually go to Bimini and in some places in Andros and see beach rock forming on the beach. And if you go separate a time separated by 10 years or so, you can see the beach rock get bigger. And people actually do go out and cut beach rock and use it for construction projects because it's very easy to cut and it's very easy to find and nobody cares if you remove it. Yeah. So that was the beginning of our whole thing. It was the it was the discoveries at Andros. They made a lot of news. Um, we were working at the time, again, as the editors of this Ancient Mysteries newsletter for the, the Casey organization. Yeah. Uh, we generated a, a lot of video, gave a lot of talks on it. So it got very well known. Uh, there were, I don't know how many, do I've, done, I've done 15 documentaries. Uh, wow several with National Geographic. Some of the later ones were about the Bermuda Triangle, and those actually were the best ones. The National Geographic oh, okay. did one. Uh, we found in our 25 weeks of explorations, we found 31 crashed planes. Wow. And, well, that sounds like a lot, but there's hundreds and hun probably yeah. thousands I mean, of them yeah, down. Definitely. Yeah, But out of those 31 planes, two of those are Bermuda Triangle planes. That is, they're on the official list of planes that disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. One of them we found on shore. The Bah it was bothering the Bahamians where it was, oh. uh, the fishermen. So they drug it up on shore, and then they decided wow. later. This was two years later. They decided that they they really wanted to take it out and put it in a dump in the water. <laughs> so in the Bahamas. If you, if you go around with side scan like we did and you're looking at miles and miles and miles and miles and you're doing this day after day for 10 hours a day, uh, what you will find is around these islands, you'll find piles of appliances like washers and dryers and, and air conditioners, all kinds of stuff. Funny. You'll find loads of planes. You will find automobiles and trucks, oh. trucks, <laughs> automobiles, trucks, 18 wheelers, trains. There are trains <laughs> there that have that apparently have fallen off of barges. Right. It's the best we That's can so tell. Crazy. Uh, but the Bahamians will take anything they find like appliances and they find what they'll call a fishing hole and they'll dump them there. Uh, to give you a, a really good example here that we learned from a Bahamian, uh, we were with uh, National Geographic at a plane. Uh, we, one of them we found was real famous. They actually sent some parts of the plane that we took out of it and sent them to the Royal Air Force in England, who then matched the part to one of their planes from World War II. Although it was, this wasn't, this was a plane that disappeared after World War II, and it was a DC-9, which has, was a passenger plane, very famous. It was second, the second disappearance in the Bermuda Triangle planes is what we found. Uh, but they verified it in England, and the Royal Air Force verified it. But in that, one of the Bahamians took us to a plane, a, one plane to look at, and he said, let me show you how to do really good fishing for lobster. And so he, this is a hint for anybody who goes down there. He simply <laughs> lifted the wings of the plane and collected, I believe it was 11 lobsters. Wow. <laughs> right under the wing. They're under the that's wing. Awesome. And he said that that's how you can find lots of lobsters really fast. Yeah. He said, find a crashed plane, lift up Just the wing. Just get a plane. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So uh, there, th there was a lot of interest in that, but we found so many others. I have identified some. 
uh, believe it or not, on Google Earth on land that we want to get to. Uh, but it's very difficult to do anything there. But that's how that's really how it all started. That's what yeah. we did. We decided when we looked at this thing at Andros, we have to go to Bimini, which we had never been to. Okay. And we've got to compare it to what is called the Bimini Road. So we began working under an archaeological permit. And later we worked under... A I think you froze up there for a minute. Oh, am I here? We yep, good? You're there again. You brought right. up for a second, but you're back. <laughs> All right. So we worked under archaeological uh, permits and film permits, and even a geological permit of a large, right. very famous group that I can't, I'm not allowed to name that we worked under. But anyway, uh, we started searching around Bimini. Uh, we found so much at Bimini that is just unreal. One of the things is we found that the skeptics uh, about Bimini had just flat lied. Uh, it's very odd. The whole story is so bizarre. It deserves its own book just for the bizarreness of what went on. For example, the very first skeptic was a geologist by the name of Wyman Harrison, who died a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Wyman Harrison wrote up about, in a, it was a letter to the editor in the journal Nature, and he said that this is all nonsense when the Bimini Road was being touted as Atlantis, and he said that uh, it's all natural beach rock, nothing to look at here, this is ridiculous. One of the other things that were found that were roughly... 20 columns off of the coastal Bimini in the inlet between Bimini is actually two islands. So there's an inlet there and buried in the sand. There are over 20 columns. Some of those are fluted marble columns. Those have all been stolen, the fluted marble, but the others are still there. So the guy wrote about that. Wyman Harrison did. Wyman Harrison was there to he was searching for gold hmm. and he was searching for gold that Edgar Casey's readings said was at Bimini. And that's how all the Bimini stuff started. Harrison was drilling for gold. And then suddenly all these people show up excited, looking for Atlantis. And he was worried it was getting in his way. Harrison gave talks and was sometimes funded by the Casey organization. And he used, and he wrote books for the Casey organization under a pseudonym. He was known as the geologist. And then he had a pseudonym called Wyman Harrison. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, that's it. That was his real name, yeah. <laughs> um, Wyman Harrison. Um, Hutton, William Hutton is the name. Oh, yeah. William okay. Hutton was actually a very famous geologist in past time. So he called himself that. Uh, and skeptics that talk about Bimini being nonsense always cite the research by Wyman Harrison, geologist Wyman Harrison has proven right. this is not Atlantis, that it's all natural. Yet Wyman Harrison himself was there looking, trying to validate Casey's readings on gold and perhaps get the gold. Uh, Wyman Harrison did this for years and even later, he published that he had found rocks of Atlantis at Bimini, but he did it under his pseudonym because he didn't want anybody to know right. that he was the person saying this is Atlantis and he is the person saying this isn't Atlantis right. professionally. Um, so the second, the other one is the other geologist is a, was, well, he's still alive, a U.S. geological survey geologist who started back then he, is, he was hired as a geologist, but he actually had a bachelor's degree in biology. Hmm. And while he was there, he's written loads of very, not just skeptical articles, but uh, very nasty articles about the people who had done this research. He actually wrote one about my wife and I after I interviewed him, talked to him huh. many times. Uh, and he said that we had built, B-I-L-K-E-D, built money from the Casey organization to do this research. What? So. I actually had to tell him that we did all of this research, everything, funded it ourselves, every yeah. penny. Of, none of it came from the Casey organization. 
And we, everything else we did for the KC organization, we actually didn't get paid for. We, we never got paid for it, didn't want it, didn't yeah. need it. So we paid for all this ourselves. But I mean, it's a, we're talking about a lot of money here. But I said, if you don't remove that, you, uh, you're going to have a lawsuit. So he removed yeah. it. He pulled the article down. That's fine. I'm OK with that. Good. Uh, but I had been told by a archaeologist who you mentioned, Bill Donato. Bill mm -hmm. would be good to get on your show. Yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill told me in our many trips together into the Bahamas, which he started going when we went to Bimini, he would, he would go along with us. Bill said that uh, this guy, the U.S. Geological Survey geologist, had actually fabricated fake archaeological artifacts in his laboratories in Miami, federal laboratories in Miami, really? and taken them to the Bimini Road and, and uh, Bimini and planted them. Wow. I didn't believe that. I mean, I said, yeah, okay. That's, that's I said, point. I'm sure that's a rumor. I said, but I just can't. First of all, it's got to be illegal. I know it's illegal oh, today. Yeah. It had to be illegal too in the in the late 60s yeah, and, and early yeah. 70s. I, but I don't know. I don't know the laws then. Uh, and But I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that even somebody that's a skeptic who hates, literally hates and makes fun of the people who search for Atlantis. Mm -hmm. uh, I just couldn't believe he'd do that. And then I saw a film of this geologist speaking in front of the geology department of a large university in Florida. And it had the faculty in there and also the chairperson of the department. And toward the end of his talk, he was asked by the chair, the chairman of that department, geology, said, you know, way back then when you were doing all that Atlanta stuff, I visited you and your labs in Miami, the, the USGS labs. And he said, and you were in there and you were carving these artifacts, stone artifacts. You were making statues and other things. And he said, and I know your plan was to take them over to the Bahamas and all. And he said, whatever became of that? Everybody laughed about it and so on. And the geologist then replied and said, yeah, we took them over. And he said, and I started watching the magazines and the news to see if one of these people would report finding some ancient artifact. And he said, but I hadn't seen it yet. And everybody laughed about it and everybody thought it was funny. So it wasn't something that was hidden at the time. Right. Even the U.S. Geological Service knew about it. I actually contacted them uh, and uh, they don't really, they didn't really care. I mean, they don't care anymore, even though the guy still is uh, an adjunct faculty with them and an adjunct, uh, they didn't really care. I was just curious what their opinion would be uh, and they don't care. So it's okay if you're on the skeptical side to try to dupe people who believe or whatever. So that was the, that's one aspect of it. Uh, but they lied about it, had the Bimini Road not having multiple tiers. The, the Bimini Road is about 1,600 feet long, and it forms a J shape like this. So right. it's 1,600 feet long. It is 50 to 60 feet wide. And it looks exact on the inside of the J, the island is like here. Mm -hmm. And then your deep water's up here. And then you have the J like this. Right. So it's a harbor. Ships would come around and they would be enclosed in the harbor. We dated it. We actually got anchors from there. We found stone anchors that look exactly like ancient Phoenician anchors. We found those with National Geographic and the History Channel. And with others, uh, we had them radiocarbon dated because they were all cut out of beach rock. They look really good. And it goes back. The, the, the anchors went back to about 500 BC. Some of them were 30 wow. BC, which puts it in the time of the Phoenicians. But the Bimini Road itself probably was a breakwater for an unknown maritime culture that operated around three to 5,000 BC. That is not the time of Atlantis. So the Bimini right. Road is not connected to Atlantis since we know Atlantis supposedly sank around 10,000 BC. Yeah. There are other stuff there that does date to 10,000 BC and Bill Donato is the first to find it. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so there's a lot of stuff there. We found building structures there. There is a 
literal building structure, a rectangular building, the foundation of it, near the inlet between North and South Bimini in about 25 feet of water, the sand moves constantly there. Every time there's a storm of any kind, the sand moves so the bottom looks different. So that's why today GPS is really essential. You really can't refine things. They get lost all the time. Uh, so there's that building there, this the famous geological group that I had mentioned to you, underwater exploration group, mm -hmm very famous group, when they got the details from us on it, they went and they measured down into the sand, the sides, and all they could get down without having a different kind of a permit, because this is archaeological, they got six feet down. So the walls of this large rectangular building, so it's like 35 feet this way, 15 mm -hmm. feet, 35 feet. And then on this end of the building, there is another square sort of building, but it's just the foundation. Foundation is made of small blocks of stone, but they've been fused together because of coral. But they got six feet down, so we know that the walls extend down in, but it's only in 20 feet of water. At the time of Atlantis, 10,000 BC, the sea levels there, we found the, the shoreline, uh, Florida State University, found where the shoreline was. You can actually dive and see the old shorelines. They're oh, very easy to find. Right. So they're at roughly 315 feet. You got to go 315 feet down to find the 10,000 BC shoreline. Oh, okay. So one of the things Bill Donato did with the ARE uh, funded a side scan sonar project where they looked at these swaths a couple miles wide by 10 miles long in the deep water near the 10,000 BC shoreline and about five miles due west of Bimini, what Bill first found was a side scan, an area that is about a mile and a half long. So if you're, this is like the bottom and you're looking at a mile and a half and what you see in this bottom is perfectly flat area. And if you look at it, you can actually see the bottom from the boat if you get in the water and look down because the water's so oh, clear. Okay. Uh, you'll see pure white sand, and then there is a square or rectangular formation, then pure white sand, and another square or rectangular formation, then pure white sand. There's three rows of these that go for a mile. They're all right at the 10,000 wow. BC shoreline. They're all square and rectangular, pure white sand between them. They're made out of stone. They have sand that has gone into the middle and lots of stuff are growing out of each one. I'm kind of like a roof collapsed with a, in a stone structure. Yeah. And then sand builds up and then things start growing on the inside. So there are over 70 of these square and rectangular structures, over 70. Wow. But they're all in straight rows, three perfect straight rows. Yeah. They're not, you know, they're not, they're not uh, mixed up. They're just perfectly straight rows. Right. Uh, built like built place. Exactly. They right. and what we believe, what we really believe it is, is that this was a uh, shipping area. It was a landing area in 10,000 BC, and these little buildings were right along the shoreline. It was places for cargo to be moved in and out. Yeah. That's what we believe. All right. So, so Bill tried to dive it, wasn't able to. Now, 115 feet is pretty deep, yeah. particularly for recreational divers. That's what yes. we are. We're all certified as recreational divers. Uh, and that was actually my wife's first dive. Really? She went down. That was the first. She had been certified for a while. Uh, that was her first dive away from all the certification oh. stuff. So we dove it with the History Channel. You can see that on... Um, it's called Mystery Quest. We did two Mystery Quest episodes. One of them was on the Bermuda Triangle. You can see a lot of the planes that we found. Uh, and the other one was on Atlantis. And they show film of going down to these stone structures, whatever they are. The people that were with us said they'd never seen anything like it anywhere in the world. And they had some really experienced underwater photographers and filmers. Uh, they knew what they were doing. They said never seen anything like it. I wasn't down there very long because I suck up air really fast. Uh, <laughs> my wife was there a little longer than I was, but all of these are just encrusted with coral. 
So they, and there are p photos where you can really clearly see that these are made out of small building blocks, a little bigger, bigger than a brick, but they're small building blocks. And they have been encrusted with coral, mm -hmm. which coral grows like crazy. They're a little deep for coral, but the coral is old. It was probably growing in the thousands of years it took for the, uh, the water to rise above them. Right. So here's the thing. You can't do anything with coral in the Bahamas. It's illegal to even touch it. Oh, you really? can't touch it. You can't do anything. So there wasn't anything we could do but film yeah. the thing. Uh, and then not too long after that, our last trip there was in late 2012, the last trip that we actually investigated things underwater. And then in 2013, uh, the Bahamas issued a uh, temporary suspension of all permits, all permits wow. for geology, for archaeology, and for salvage. There's and for filming. There's four types of permits, uh, and they they suspended them all. And it stayed suspended for almost four years while they rewrote the laws. What had happened is an American group, a salvage group, had come in. They had done salvage at supposedly what were Spanish galleons. And then they went straight back to the United States and claimed they found nothing. And the Bahamas didn't believe it. You have to share, you know, to get a salvage thing, you have to share a certain amount of the loot with the Bahamas. Yeah. Uh, and so they suspended it all and changed all the laws. All the laws were changed. Uh, I actually had a contact in the Bahamian Supreme Court uh, who came to Memphis. I live in Memphis. That's where I am. Uh, and we do these trainings. Uh, in criminal justice here. And I met a um, contact in the Bahamian Supreme Court there. They, about, the Bahamas uses uh, a treatment system that I've been, I'm involved with in criminal justice. So that's how I got to meet him. So I talked to him about this and they said it has become, it had become so corrupt there that they had to rewrite everything. Wow. Uh, and I asked about, is it going to be better? And he said, nah, probably not, but I don't know. So anyway, it's almost impossible now, <coughs> excuse me, it's almost impossible to get an archaeological permit in the Bahamas. Uh, you can do it, but you have to have, you have to know you're going to have good weather. You can't change dates. You have to employ one of them to go with you. And there's only two <laughs> right, in the Bahamas right. archaeology. And you have to put down an area that is no more than one mile square. No more searching and looking wow. around for anything. No more of that. You can't do it. It's, Ill it's illegal to search. That's you, even if you don't touch, it's illegal wow. to search without a yeah. permit. So anyway, that's kind of a thumbnail of it. We found lots and lots of stuff. The last thing we found is probably the most interesting of all of it. In Edgar Casey's readings about Atlantis, this is where Bimini comes in. Mm -hmm. In his readings about Atlantis, Edgar Casey said, that toward the end, the Atlantean priests were notified through portals. I won't, uh, portals from the outer spheres. You can okay. decide what that means. But right. Casey said the, the priests were told by intelligences from these portals that Atlantis was going to be destroyed by something from the sky. And that in preparation of, for this, because they were going to be destroyed, they needed to make what he called, what they called a hall of records. Yeah. And instead of one hall of records, they needed to make three identical hall of records. The hall of records was to contain all of the history and knowledge of Atlantis. And all three of them were supposed to be identical, have the same things in it. One of those was supposed to be in Egypt under yes. the right paw of the Sphinx. That yes. is the most famous one. Yeah. And that I've actually talked about in a previous episode. Of, I'm sure of you my have. Because I talked about the dating of the Sphinx and yeah. the chamber yeah. under the paw that Dr. Robert Ab Schock is talking about. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that all I comes. The theory. Yeah. Yep. All that comes from Edgar Casey. Uh, they're actually, if they're, there's a lot that's been found there. Uh, Andrew Collins, uh, the British author ha, who is, Andrew discovered this cave complex under Giza back, I believe it was 2008, 
uh, got very well known, a lot written about it. I made a documentary on that. Andrew did a book, the ARE published, the ARE funded his research there. He went, he and his wife went and talked to Zahi Hawass about it. Hawass said, no, it's impossible. We know everything. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> and then Hawass actually was then doing the show called Chasing Mummies. And one of the very last shows is called Bats, B-A-T-S. And it's where Hawass actually was shown this underground cave system, followed it for 330 feet toward the Great Pyramid, said it was the greatest adventure he had ever had, but he had on his website that this cave system does not exist. He, he said it doesn't exist, but he did it on this show called Bats, and it's called Bats because it's filled with bats. It's gigantic. A lot yeah. of it's been carved by man, but they never got to the end of it. That's the bottom line to it. Wow. But Andrew found that. Uh, Andrew, of course, has written lots about Atlantis. And Andrew had uh, looked in, he's been to Bimini with us. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine. We've co-authored a number of books, have another one coming out in March of 2022. Yes. Uh, but anyway, uh, in, the, in one of the very last trips that we took, we were led by our Bahamian contacts who we had paid very well. That's how we found so much. Yeah. And that's also why people in prior years never found anything because the Bahamians weren't just, they wanted them to give the, the researchers were planning on the Bahamians just giving them all this information and they don't do that. Uh, you have to treat them well. And so we treated people very well and we still do. Uh, we always cite them, all our books, give their names, tell what they did. Without them, we couldn't have done any of this. But in Casey's three hall of records, one in Egypt, most famous one, uh, the most unknown one is in a place called Piedras Negras, Guatemala. Uh, my wife had been there uh, and I, we did a expedition there. It is a very, very remote site. Uh, very difficult to get to, very dangerous, not made for tourists, uh, not a place you can get to easily. You got to make special preparations that we could talk about that for hours. But anyway, we've been there, too. And the third one, he said uh, in his readings, he said that a temple of the Poseidians that contained the Hall of Records was near Bimini. And he called them the Poseidon. Poseidon, of course, is the Greek god who supposedly started Atlantis. Right. So Casey called it a temple of the Poseidons. And he said that if you do, if, if one were to do a survey down the Gulf Stream from Bimini, you would be able to find it. So down the Gulf Stream from Bimini, about 30 miles down, in a, there's deep water it's it's kind of hard to describe, but there's deep water on one side. It falls off and it goes down to hundreds and then to thousands of feet. Yeah. So there's a like a top part, a high part, and it's about 20 feet from the surface, about 20 feet from the surface. Mm -hmm. And then it falls down 40, 50, 60 to 100 feet on the other side. Yeah. So it's an area that's elevated up, almost like you'd think it would be a mountain peak is kind of what it looked like. Okay. So it's all smooth sand till you get to that. And then what's on top of this thing, which is pretty big, is a 600 foot long pile of polished cut carved stone, 600 feet long. It's teardrop shape, big teardrop. Right. And it's about 100 feet wide or so. And it's piled up roughly 20 feet. So the top of it comes to approximately 20 feet off the bottom. Right. There are columns, fluted columns along the edges of it. There are real poly. I mean, it's incredible. It's made of green and purple schist. Schist is spelled S-C-H-I-S-T. Yeah. Most people don't know this, but the temple of uh, Delphi, the Oracle of Delphi is made from polished schist. Underwater, this schist, when you, uh, the Bahamian that operated our boat, we usually hired a Bahamian captain to use our boat. By then, of course, we were using our boat for all those last years. Um, 
he went down and he chipped the piece off and under where he chipped the piece off and you can see this polyschist, it looks like it's glowing and it's purple and green and it's incredible what the light does to, to it. Yeah. Uh, we sent several of the samples off to several geological labs and universities and got back a lot of information. Uh, it probably comes from Greece. Uh, that's what they believe where it comes from. It's the most likely place. It appears to be the remains of a temple, very clear. Uh, and it looks, remember I said that it's in this teardrop shape. Yeah. It looks like it was a standing building and that a tsunami came and hit it and oh. just tilted, knocked the whole thing over right. to create it. That's what it looks like. And that's why we think that all these, these fluted columns are laying around the edges. So when we found this thing, we also found that in 1908, a ship hit it because you can't tell it's in deep, it's in deep water, Yeah, but it's stuck up and you can't see it. You cannot see this from the surface. Right. Uh, it's not covered with a lot of coral. And the reason is I was so careful to explain, you know, it's real deep on one side and it's kind of deep in the other is because the tidal flow goes back and forth atop it. And when that tidal flow moves, man, it's like being in a river that's gone 10 to 15 miles an hour. And if you're like snorkeling or you're above that or in a boat, it just sweeps you away. Yeah. It's unreal. Right. It's dangerous. And you can only be on it for slack time. So it's like twice a day for about an hour, hour and 20 minutes, you can be on it. Oh. But then when that tidal, tidal move starts, then you got to get out of there. Right. Uh, and it also keeps the coral from forming on it. So we don't know how old it is, but we found that a ship in 1908 hit it. Very cool. Um, they didn't know what they hit. Uh, and the ship actually caught fire and burned, burned into the, the oh. it, it burned. And then a salvage crew came from Nassau, which is a long way to come. Uh, and then they picked up whatever they could salvage and took it back. But they yeah. never gave, the, the location was unknown. Nobody could really come up with exact locations then. So uh, we reported this to the Bahamas um, and this was right before all this other salvage stuff occurred. Uh, and they told us that, okay, we know this, we now know because we had sent them the proof that this is an archeological site. <clears throat> so they said, unless you get a specific archeological permit, you can't go back. Although we could go back on a film permit, but they also said in this, you can't tell anybody where this is because it's never been investigated. So we couldn't tell anybody where it was. Right. So I started getting contacts from people who are interested. And one of those was the Microsoft Corporation. Oh, okay. Uh, Microsoft sponsors a lot. They have a foundation that sponsors a lot of archaeological work. And one of their head people called me several times, asked me about it. And he said, we are interested in going to this thing and rebuilding it in place, mm. reconstruct it. And now we had seen this a lot. We'd filmed it a lot. Uh, and there was so much damage done to this thing. I said, I, I don't think you can really reconstruct it. And I said, unless you look at this, I don't think you understand. You can't reconstruct this thing in place. And he said, oh, we can build a wall and keep the water out. And I said, I, I don't think so. Yeah, that's uh, I don't think so. I said, maybe you could you could take all that, put it on land. There's an island not too far away. Maybe you could put it on that island or better yet, build it on Bimini and turn right. it into a tourist attraction. But I said, you can't do it there. And I don't think it can be reconstructed. Right. And he said, well, can you tell us where it is? And I said, we are not allowed to tell you where it is, but I'll tell you what. I will give you the phone number of a Bahamian captain who's been there and you can talk to him. So they did. He took them to it. And they looked at it and decided, no, we can't reconstruct it yeah. here, but we might do something with it. So they immediately went to the archaeology office in the Bahamas and they filed a salvage permit. And salvage is to get it all, take it somewhere. They're not allowed to keep it, but take it somewhere and maybe work on it. So that's where it all stopped. I uh, know they haven't done anything with it yet, but they made the claim on it and the Bahamas approved their claim on it. 
So that's the that was the final story of that. Uh, very impressive structure. Uh, we have put some film out about it, but we've never really given the location. We just basically say it's 30 miles south of Bimini. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff there. There's loads of stuff at Bimini. I haven't talked about it all. There are yeah. there are just incredible things in the water around yeah. there. So definitely, I mean, um, there's the the I mean, just even what you've talked about today. A lot of a lot of what you said today, I had absolutely no idea about any yeah. of this. And I mean, it's you know, I'm a you talk a lot about skeptics, and I consider myself a skeptic a lot. You know, like I'm skeptical about you know aliens and Bigfoot, yeah. Loch Ness monster, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you know, I I've looked into and tried to debunk this ancient lost technology in Atlantis, you know, cause it sounds crazy here, Atlantis, yeah. an ancient civilization from tens of thousands of years ago. It sounds crazy, but that's the one thing that I've held on to as far as my beliefs go, because the evidence is there. I mean, the evidence yeah. is extremely compelling. And for me it personally, is. I, I look, I don't know if you've heard about like the theory of the Rakat structure in, um, in Africa, that I know that what I it is. Sahara possibly, right? Being I know what it is. Of, yeah. um, the lost city of Atlantis. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what's um? Well, what I, do you think? I think uh, okay. So I'm going to lead you to something to look at on Google Earth when you get a chance. Um, the structure in Africa, I think, is probably natural. That's me. Just just saying. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, it doesn't fit what Plato said about Atlantis, where it is. Plato was very clear in that it was in the Atlantic. He said that if you hop from island to island in the Atlantic, you could reach the other continent. Mm -hmm. And he said that it was an island in the Atlantic. Um, Casey, Casey called it an island empire, as did, well, so did uh, uh, Plato. Plato called it an empire too, an island empire. Uh, it's more in both Casey's readings and in Plato's story of Atlantis, uh, it was mainly a maritime culture. It was a maritime trading culture. And the, by definition, a maritime trading culture, the cities and the towns are on the coast. They're always on the coastline. If you read Plato carefully, he gave a description of the main island of Atlantis. He gave its dimensions. And I, as I recall, it's roughly... Uh, 600 miles by 150 miles like on that. the southern part, close to the middle of the island, on the southern side. Uh, and there was a mountain range in the middle of the island. On the southern side, there was a circular, make it a small island because they built these concentric rings around it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a small center city. It was a diameter of roughly a mile and a half. That's it. But it was set on this island. Now, the, from the mountains in the north running south, there was a, a lot of canals because it was agricultural land to the south of the, of the mountains. And these canals eventually ran into this circular area. And the, the center city was in the middle of this circular area. And of course, it was surrounded by water. And then he said there was a seven mile canal that led to the ocean from there. Mm -hmm. And nothing has been found that really matches that description. He said it was tropical and they had two growing seasons in this. And so Andrew Collins uh, first book on this was called Atlantis in Cuba, and he believes it was in Cuba. He came up with, uh, there is an island, it's called the Isle of Youth, that is south of Cuba, and that's where he thought it was. And then as I got into this, I got really interested in it. We've tried to go to this spot. It's not the Isle of Youth. It's in the uh, Zapata Peninsula, and it is an area that for years I've tried to go to. And if you get on Google Earth, and you find what is called the Bay of Pigs, Bay of Pigs, and then go exactly due west from the Bay of Pigs, you will see a circular area. You'll see a mountain to the north, mountains, 
And if you really get down, you pull down, you'll see almost the checkerboard pattern of ancient canals that have been called uh, Taino canals, which is the name of the Indians, uh, Native Americans that lived there. Okay. And these canals all go to single canals that go into the circular area. And then there's a seven mile swath that goes to the ocean from there. Hmm. It matches it perfectly. Yeah. Now, the where the center city was, I got the, it's water. It's like a circle. It's yeah. a mile and a half across, a little over a mile and a half across. And you can actually see the bottom on Google Earth. And I got these old British Navy soundings, depth chart soundings, and they went in there <coughs> and it looks like it's got a series of areas where it's high and then there's a little deep spot and then it's high and then it'll almost like there were these circular rings around it. So yeah. that is one I want to go look at. Wow. Uh, yeah, but but it's it's easy to see on Google Earth. I've published it on many articles in many places. It's in our book on Atlantis. Uh, well, we did several books on Atlantis. So yeah. anyway, Casey said that Atlantis at the end had five big islands. They were in the Caribbean. That's what was left. And that uh, they broke up into three big ones uh, and then to a bunch of small ones uh, at the end of the last ice age, shortly gotcha. thereafter. So that's the idea. And the great Bahama Bank and the little Bahama Bank uh, were actually gigantic during the last ice age. Uh, even the while, like I told you, you can walk miles and miles into the ocean there and you're not in water that's 300 feet deep. You're in yeah. water at the most, it's maybe 100, 110. When you get 10, 15 miles offshore, yeah. Uh, but in that, in the giant uh, Great Bahama Bank, it's several hundred miles long, several hundred miles wide. That was a big island. Yeah, it's all underwater. And that's what we believe all these all this maritime culture by definition, when the sea levels rose by 300 feet, they went under. And they, the surviving people went somewhere else. That's the belief. That's what Casey said. Uh, Plato didn't talk about the survivors much. Uh, in fact, he never he didn't mention them. His story just kind of ends when uh, Zeus is about to explain why he destroyed Atlantis or how it happened. It just ends. Yeah. Uh, but Casey went into all that and talked about it. Uh, and the Atlanteans, he said, did do those hall of records. The, some of the Atlanteans became the Iroquois tribe. And Casey is the only person that I know of who has ever written or talked about Atlantis who said the Atlanteans were the red race. They were native Americans. Wow. They were that race. Yeah. Only one. Uh, people have said, oh, he stole, he got all his stuff from Blavatsky or from yeah. uh, Donnelly and all that. No, uh, there's lots of other stuff, Casey said, that doesn't match anything they said. Uh, wow. His story is very unique. But it's weird that almost everywhere you follow and you look up something Edgar Casey said about the ancient world, you find that there is a grain of truth to it. And sometimes it's just flat truth. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, cause like I said, I'm, I'm a skeptic and, you know, I've, I've talked to psychics and stuff and it's, so I'm a little honestly weird about Edgar Casey, you know, and him calling yeah. himself, you know, the world's greatest psychic that kind of, you know, makes, makes me feel weird at the yeah. same time, you know, looking into his stuff. Cause it's like, I almost immediately want to be like, Oh, you know, he's a psychic or whatever. But well, K Casey never called himself that Casey was actually very humble. He was a, uh, fundamentalist Christian. And he stayed fundamentalist Christian to the very end. This caused them a great, his family, a great deal yeah. of consternation. I can imagine. Uh, but they were helping people. Remember, it was all about helping people and these health readings for a long, long time. And all these other readings popped up accidentally when reincarnation emerged. And there was this guy by the name of Arthur Lammers who took Casey and he said, I want to bring you to Chicago and I want to ask you a series of questions. So he brought hit Casey's family to Chicago. Uh, and under his hypnotic, Casey goes under a hypnotic trance. Mm -hmm. uh, and they started writing it all down. It's all documented. The reason Casey's, Casey is considered the greatest psychic of all time is because everything he said is written down. You can test it. Right. <laughs> Something fell. <laughs> Hang on. Sure. At a mishap. 
Maybe it was that. Oh, <laughs> I I don't know. I have no idea what that. There's nothing in here to fall. Oh, maybe Might that was been. Edgar communicating. You like you got yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, awesome. Anyway, jeez, uh, what was I saying? That was weird. <laughs> that was very very strange. That because everything shook here. It's almost like a mini earthquake. I've been through earthquakes before and they last a little longer. Right. Um, they seldom are just one big shake like sure. that. Maybe like so. a jet flew over here or something. But. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't but, know. Uh, yeah. Right. You've given me so much to think about. I mean, I the things, because that's the thing is that I follow where the evidence leads. Yeah. You know, if the evidence doesn't point towards an ancient civilization, I don't follow it. I follow the evidence, the evidence right sure. now the evidence is pointing towards that there was some sort of civilization upwards of 10,000 plus uh years ago and they a lot of people get thrown off because they think that when when i or you or anyone else mentions atlantis that we're talking about like mermaid people or people they have like flying cars and yeah. lasers and it's like yeah. no that's not what we're trying a proponent of you know they're right. very much a human race and they had very human technologies it's just they were alive before what we originally believed and that they had this technology that we still don't quite understand yeah um and that's what well, we a misconception about even even plato plato's description of it they had horses and chariots yes they used they used spears and they had swords Casey's exactly. reading of Atlantis is not that much different, but people like to say, oh, they had uh, submarines and planes and yeah. spaceships and all that. No, that's not the, the planes and submarines are not in Casey's readings. What is there is a crystal technology, which is not all that far fetched. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it wasn't so far fetched, actually, from my father when he worked at NASA. That's sure. a long story. But uh, Casey said that they did fly, but they flew in what today would be called a blimp or a dirigible. And they used hot air. They were hot air. And he said they actually made the outer skin of it from this tied skins of pachyderms, elephants. Wow. It would take yeah. elephant skin, tie them together right, right. and sew them together tight fill them full of hot air. And he said, that is what their flying devices were. People, even a lot of Casey people don't like to think about that. They like to yeah. think that Casey meant that they had planes and spaceships and all that. Yeah. Um, but he didn't really say that, but he said that they had advanced technology and a lot of that advanced technology was based upon crystal technology that they had the ability to take large crystals and focus light forms. So that's the story with that. Yes. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, Casey actually, again, did not call himself uh, the greatest psychic. Casey was called uh, a doctor and a psychic by the New York Times. That's how it started. He didn't even know that they had written these articles. And it was from the research that doctors had done, and they actually made presentations at two large medical conferences. One was at Caltech in California, and the other one was a presentation in front of 600 physicians at Harvard University. And the New York Times was there, and they heard this, and they published an article called, uh, that was titled, Illiterate Man Becomes Doctor When Hypnotized. <laughs> That's how it started. Wow. And then Casey started getting tons and tons of letters uh, from people asking for help. That's how he got famous. Interesting. Then the American Medical Association, the, the Journal of the American Medical Association, an article in that, the editorial lead article about holistic health, said that it started with Edgar Casey and they named Casey the father of the holistic health movement. That is where that comes from. Casey never said any of that. Casey just simply said, take it for what it is. I hope it helps. Uh, but if it doesn't, let me know. He often said yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's really incredible. I have so much more uh, that, that I want to you know, go over with you. We'll do it and, again. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, definitely. I once again, I really appreciate you being on here. You gave me so much to think about and so much information, and I definitely have to have you on again to talk more about what you have. Because I mean, man, you you've done most of the talking for this episode, and I love it because <laughs> you just you keep giving me you know things to look up, and like I've got mm. my notepad off to the side here. You know, I'm taking notes. I'm uh I'm really excited about this conversation, and I really appreciate you coming on and and sharing your story with us. And I really hope to have you on again, Greg. All right. Well, thank you for the invite. Uh, we'll do it again. Uh, I've got a, we, Andrew Collins and I have one here. Yeah. Please. And I don't, does you this, uh, you would like does this show reversed? Is that reversed? Uh, nope. Nope. I see a path. Of all right. Uh, man, I don't have it here. So it's all right. Uh, if you, if you Google me, and put my middle initial in because there's a, if you Google Greg Little, you're going to find a football player. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but if you Google Gregory L. Little, you'll find me. I'll pop up in your little knowledge thing and all that, and it'll show books and it'll show how to contact me. There's a lot of ways. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, uh, apmagazine.info, apmagazine.info. I've got a lot there. Uh, I write a lot on that particular website uh, and elsewhere, but I'm easy to find Twitter, Facebook. Uh, and like I said, a lot of, uh, you can find me on Google pretty easily, yeah. but it's all there. It's a pleasure. And yeah, let's do it again. We'll talk about some of the new stuff. Uh, there is a lot of new stuff and absolutely. you specifically said you wanted to go over the Atlanta stuff and there we are. Yeah, there we are. I mean, I just, I figured it was perfect for what I was, I had just talked about last week. I yeah. was like, oh man, I have to go over Atlantis with one of them. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about the structure in uh, Africa. I, hey. it's very weird. I just, there's an island off of, off of, uh, right between Gibraltar. Most people don't know this. Yeah. Yes. There's a huge island. If you go straight out of Gibraltar into the Atlantic, about three or four miles out there, there's an underwater island called Spartail. Yes. And a lot of people like to say, oh, that was Atlantis too, but it's not, it wasn't big enough. Right. It was not big enough to be the main island of Atlantis. And that's yeah. one way. You got to look at everything Plato said and everything Casey said. Definitely. And the only thing that even gets close to all of it uh, is the area in the Caribbean. There's nothing else okay. that gets, you have to eliminate or ignore almost everything Plato said to make places fit. Yeah, that's the problem with every there's nothing in the med it can't be in the Mediterranean and lots of people say oh instead of being outside Gibraltar or outside the pillars of Hercules Plato meant to say it was inside <laughs> you actually will read books on that that say that oh that proves that it was uh, yeah. somewhere there's a whole bunch of places there that have been suggested. Uh, so any anyway, Santorini's the main one. Some people say it was Malta. Some yeah. people say it was Sicily. There's islands around Greece where they say it was. And I think all that's nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. It either, um, it either I, existed in the Atlantic or it didn't. It's that. Right. Same. Yeah. I, um, I actually watched, I don't know if you know the, the geologist Randall Carlson. Um, yes. I've met him. I've talked to him quite a few cool. times. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get in contact with him to have a conversation with him, but uh, okay. he's hard guy to contact, but he, he's kind of a proponent of the Azores Islands um, yeah. outside of Gibraltar being Atlantis. Yeah. And I've kind of looked into that and some of it's kind of interesting, but I mean, to be honest, and honestly, there was a, there's this documentary called uh, Visiting Atlantis. I think it's Visiting Atlantis and it's actually yeah. available on YouTube right now. And they yeah. actually go over a lot of the theories of the Rakat structure possibly yeah. being, um, you know, the location of Atlantis and all the evidence to support that. So that's yeah. an interesting documentary. It's interesting. I agree. I've seen um, it. But I do think that you um, have have stronger evidence that the Mini Road and, and the Bahamas is a more probable location. Well, that area, yeah, I just yeah. it's that it's very clear that cannot be a it's harbor something. for Atlantis because it's in too shallow of water for ten thousand BC. Yeah. So that's the thing you got to find something right. along the ten thousand BC shoreline, particularly since they are describing a maritime culture. Maritime cultures are not in high land. They're near the ocean. They always are. Absolutely. Think of all of our maritime cities now. How many of them are in the Rocky Mountains? There you go. None. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Yeah. None. Sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, I had an awesome time, Greg. It gave me Thank so you. much to think about. I'm going to look up, I mean, everything that you've talked about. I'm going to double check. I'm going to hop on Google Earth right now, start looking up <laughs> some right. stuff. 
And uh, I definitely got to pick up some of your books. I don't have any on me. And, and I got I to gotta build up my shopping list here and get some books. Oh, but, I got you. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Greg. I really appreciate you again. And uh, All right. we'll you do it again real soon. Okay.